if as an artist you want to propose something, let's say for the Boys and Girls Club, your job is to find out what their job is and figure out how to do it for them. Hi, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, you get my conversations with peak performing thought leaders, creatives, and entrepreneurs. We explore how you can innovate through creativity, compassion, and collaboration. I believe that innovation combined with compassion and creative thinking can save the world, and I aim to bring you ways you can do it too. If you're enjoying the show, I'd be super grateful if you can support it by buying me a cup of coffee. You can buy me a cuppa at buymeacoffee.com slash Isolde T. And now, let's get on with the show. Hey there, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg, and I am super thrilled that you are here. And I'm also incredibly thrilled to introduce you to this week's guest. Teresa Funk believes there's an artist in everyone, and you know how close to my heart that is. She's published seven inspiring books for adults and children based on true stories from World War II, including Dancing in Combat Boots, love that title, and War on a Sunday Morning. Her newest book, Bursts of Brilliance for a Creative Life, takes readers in a new direction, encouraging them to ignite their creative spirits in order to bring better ideas into our world. Another very close to my heart thing. It's based on her popular blog of the same name, so I'm going to definitely put Bursts of Brilliance blog in the show notes. Watch out for that. Teresa is a community catalyst, speaking widely and running programs that support history, education, literacy, writing, the arts, and personal development. Wow, I'm so excited to speak with you, Teresa. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much. It's great to be here. I appreciate it. I'm so excited to talk to you about so much of this. There, there are a couple of questions I want to start off with. First of all, there's a lot going on here for me as far as your decision to be a community involvement person, that you've decided the community involvement is something that you're really going to focus on. I absolutely adore that. And I'm also incredibly thrilled to hear a little bit more about bursts of brilliance like the fact that everyone has an inner artist inside them and i know that it's two questions but pick one please and start because i'd love to know how did you start with this very unique approach sure well i'm i will start with the inner artist because that is one of my favorite things to talk about and advocate for which everyone has an inner artist and I have had plenty of people argue with me and say, oh, no, no, that's that's not me. I, I'm not an artist. Um, because we have a view in this country that artists are people who paint or dance. And we have very specific views of what talent is. But the fact is, if we to our core, if we go back to the person we were when we were three or four years old, we did not doubt our inner artist then. We knew that we had talent and skill. We were little children, whether we were hands or a stick in the mud, we knew that what we were doing was art and that it was beautiful and that it was an expression of ourselves. And we did not until some outer voice, some outer critic caused us to doubt it. And that mm. might have been a parent or an older sibling, a teacher, someone stepped in and made a judgment about the work we did and we were taught rules and practices and protocols that maybe our art didn't quite fit into mm. and we started to doubt ourselves as artists and so a lot of the people i talk to you know i might be talking to someone who's a mechanical engineer for example and they'll say oh no i i you know i'm not creative and if i talk to you minutes i can uncover their creativity it's always there no matter who i'm talking to and so it's been really fun for me just to get people who don't think of themselves as artists to get back in touch with their inner artist. Mm. Absolutely. And it, it's amazing to me that you can do that because people, people have a lot of resistance around that. And I would love to talk to you about that. I don't know if you've read Stephen Pressfield's uh, The War of Art. And it, he talks a lot about resistance and people being resistant to accepting their their inner artist but we can save that I, I would also really love it if you wouldn't mind talking about your decision to focus on nonprofits and literacy 
and education like how did you decide that would be the focal point for what you do next well one of my um, areas of advocacy among the arts and among artists is to remind artists that we have sort of this unique skill set and talents that allow us to move around within different sectors and those sectors might be business, education, health and wellness, um, city, you know, the city that you live in, the politics, your faith communities. And art have this really unique ability to move around within between those sectors. So one of the things that I've been fascinated with is that most people do not realize that professional artists, we run our own businesses. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to we have to pay our bills and our bookkeepers and we have to run our businesses. And so in order to stay in business, I started thinking, well, what if we used our to combine our work with community service mm. so that we could do more good out in the community? And so I've tried to model that myself. So for example, if you are an artist and you wanted to work with the Boys and Girls Club and you need to propose something for them, um, then you could go to them and you could say, that you wanted to do a particular type of program for them. So for me, it was a literacy program that I wanted to run for them. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that, that is important to remember is that people who work at nonprofits, for example, are very busy. Mm -hmm. And many of them are doing two different jobs, three different jobs. And so it's not as simple as walking into a nonprofit and saying, hey, I'm an artist, talented. I have this idea for your kids. It's that we have to do our duties first and learn about the organization and learn about that person's job and learn about their needs and not just propose what we want, but what they need. And then you figure out what their job is and you figure out how to do it for them because they're very busy people and we want to support that. Mm -hmm. So once you figure those things out, maybe you go visit the clubs, maybe you read a lot um, of their newsletters and you figure out those things. Another thing I like to do is go find a donor, a sponsor, who will sponsor me to do that work for the clubs so that I'm not asking them to pull from their already tight pants. I'm finding someone else who maybe loves children, who is interested in literacy, and they will provide the funds so the organization doesn't have to go out and find funding. And... What I try to do is find somebody who doesn't already support the Boys and Girls Club so that I'm bringing in a new donor, a new connection for them, mm -hmm. and that also benefits them. So what I'm always get excited about is a win, win, win. And if I can get four wins, then I know that I have something that's really going to take off and work well. Mm -hmm. So the four wins in this case would be that I win because I bring a little bit of needed income into my business. The Boys and Girls Club wins because they get a literacy program that they get to tell their other sponsors, hey, we're doing literacy work. We're helping our kids learn to read and write better. The kids win because they get free books. They get um, some education that's fun for them. And the donor wins. The sponsor wins because they get to feel good about supporting something that's beneficial to their community. So that uh, win, win, win. And especially if there's the four wins, then I know I'm onto something. And I think many artists are positioned very well to do this, whether it's the nonprofit sector, education, like I said, city programs, but we have to be the ones to think about it. We can't always just expect somebody to come knock on our door and ask us to do something for them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It sounds like there's a proactive aspect of this that's really uh, important in in the business model that you've set up for yourself and i think i'm first of all i i very impressive and second of all i love the fact that you are doing it's almost like you're doing some of the development work for the nonprofits for them so that it's easier for them to partner with you is that absolutely you think, and oh, go ahead I was going to say, if there's a if there's a skill set that I'm missing, oftentimes I can find somebody to help me with that. So, for example, with my um, author visit program that I do for schools, I wanted to be able to provide lesson plans for the teachers 
for my books, because Mm -hmm. again, that's taking work off their plate. They would normally have to develop their own lesson plans. And if I could provide them the lesson plans, like what a gift that is to give them. So I hired a friend of mine who was a retired teacher and a curriculum director And she wrote the lesson plans for me. So then I knew that they were what the educators needed. I would necessarily do a lesson plan myself without doing a ton of study on how on how you put them together. And then I was also able to tell the teachers these were designed by a teacher and they understood that the sponsors understood that and it gave the whole program more credibility. So it isn't always me. I do my due diligence and I do my work. But if I need somebody else's creative i'm willing to collaborate with someone else i it it sounds like you know then there's five wins right then 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 this collaborator that you can bring in also gets a chance to flex their creative muscles and in this case educational muscles i love that i there's something that i'm curious about when you are working for example with boys and girls clubs or going into schools You mentioned something earlier about how children don't doubt their inner artists. They tend to go, I'm going to bang on, bang on a pot with a spoon, or I'm going to make up a story that I'm a pirate, or I'm going to, whatever it is that they do, they don't tend to doubt it. When you work with these kids in schools, what is that like for these kids? Is there an age at which they start feeling judged and don't think that they're inherently creative? Or do you feel like they're willing to accept that at any age? That's a great question. Um, When I do school visits, what I've noticed, and I've asked my teacher friends about this, is um, up to the sixth grade will still raise their hands and ask questions or Mm. give me an example or participate in a story building exercise that we're doing Once you hit seventh grade, something happens. Something happens in that magical year between sixth grade and seventh grade where you can see them start to raise their hand and then they don't. Hmm. And I'm really good now at watching for that. And I might call on that person or, you know, I can judge whether or not they would feel comfortable speaking. But something happens between sixth and seventh grade where they, they lose the confidence to be wrong, to... Um, potentially say something that would get them laughed at to be the person who is raising their hand and maybe looking like a teacher's pet. It's like all kinds of their own judgments hold them back. Now, when I work with them individually, seventh graders, totally different. Mm. They're so excited about their stories. They're so eager to talk to me and and get my opinion about a character or a storyline. Um, but yeah, I think in the like a class thing, something happens at that age where we start to really judge ourselves. Interesting. I, I, it makes me wonder how much of that aligns with puberty, you know, that, that that's when they start getting into that part of development. And it, we're not psychologists, I know, but it is something that I'm really curious about because if you're going to try and nurture this burst of brilliance, I bet that you have to have a lot of tools in your toolbox to help them overcome that if you're working with kids and then even more so if you're working with adults. So I guess that brings me to my next question. When you're talking about that burst of brilliance and you're talking either to a five-year-old or a 35-year-old, how do you nurture that? What what do you do to help someone else nurture it? Or or if someone decides that they want to do it themselves and nurture their own burst of brilliance, how what are the first steps? How should they do it? Yes. So let me start by explaining that a brilliance is that moment when you get an idea and you feel like that idea is absolutely a hundred percent excited about the idea Mm. and we run upstairs and we say oh my god guess guess what i just thought of or listen to this listen to this that's that burst of brilliance moment and it happens when you're a kid it happens when you're an adult it happens in your career it happens in your personal life and it's that moment before the inner critic steps in Mm. and the outer critics step in when we believe anything is possible when we believe we are brilliant Listen Mm. to this brilliant idea, right? 
So a big part of it um, with everyone, including the kids, is permission, you know, giving them permission to say, just tell me. It doesn't have to be perfect. You know, it doesn't have to be right out of the out of the gate ideal. Just tell me what you're thinking. Just talk to me about this idea you have. And oftentimes when people have that permission, they light up and mm. they start sharing in a way that they weren't sharing before. They can regain that confidence just hearing themselves say it aloud. So permission is a really big part, I think. Mm. Sorry, I'm thinking because it's uh, it's so fascinating to me that that you know I always talk I, I'm a musician and a writer as well as podcasting and I and I always talk about the fact that the very first thing we do after we're born is breathe and the second is we make sound we we sing we make noise and we don't mm -hmm. there's nothing that stops a baby from crying the baby's crying because the baby's crying and the baby doesn't think oh I shouldn't be crying and so something happens and you say that it's the inner critic and the outer critic what are our best defenses against that why first of all why do we listen to that to those doubters and those critics and what are our best defenses against those critics well i think one thing that happens is we put ourselves into boxes and so for example you mentioned music i have a friend who is, was a professional musician for most of his life although much of the time it was a side gig and he said, oh, I never, never considered myself an artist. I was just a musician. Mm. And I said, what's the difference? And he said, well, I didn't create the music. I just played it. Wow. And so we put ourselves into these boxes once we learned the rules and the protocol patterns and that we're supposed to follow. And people will say to me, I'll say, how do you, what makes you think you're not creative? Look at this beautiful knitting that you do. And they'll say, oh, that's, I'm just following a pattern. But if I were to show that knitted work to the, her fellow knitters and say, can you tell who did this? They would probably say yes. And they'd say, Joe's, she always does off her yarn that way. Or she gravitates towards the bright colors. So even when there's a pattern structure and a level of rules, we find our own way to put our little small or big um, artistic self into that. And so for me, I, I think a big part of it is helping people understand you can put into a box and you've been told what creativity looks like, you've been told what your artistic self looks like, but boxes are things that we can spring out of. You know, there are, there are things that we can stack on top of each other and move within each other and we can do all kinds of things with our boxes. We're not stuck there forever. It's our choice to leave the box. And so that's a big part of it is just getting people to see you are creative. You've just convinced yourself that you're not, hmm. right? You've, you've followed the rules. You've done what you were told. And you haven't even seen how your little individual self has been asserting itself all along. And so part of it is showing them that. Sort of, I'm, I'm here. I'm an artist. Get used to it kind of thing. I... I I love right. <laughs> I, I love that you said that you've been asserting yourself all along. I, I agree with you completely. I think we're all creative, absolutely. I I feel like there's something I, I the the best way I can say it is that, that there's a there's sort of a doubt monster that lives <laughs> inside many people's heads and asserting that, oh, your knitting is is creative is great from the outside. But what can we tell ourselves on the inside that would help us? Because, you know, if you're there and you're in a classroom and you help a child be more creative and, or, 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 uh, and or write a, a story or a poem or whatever it is they're writing, I think that's great. And it might give them a seed for after you leave. But what can you leave a six-year-old six or a 10 or a 12-year-old with that will help them in you know tomorrow or the next day or the next week in order to to keep that little flame alive mm -hmm. 
I think with the younger kids, a big part of it is telling them, this is yours. This belongs to you. Mm. Because when you're, you're young, ever, so much of your life is controlled and you don't get to say. But younger artists, it's about telling them, this isn't about what anyone else thinks. You don't even have to show your art to anyone else if you don't want to. This is yours. It belongs to you. It's in, it lives inside of you. Hear it in your head. You see it in your mind. And it all belongs to you. And when they understand that, a lot of young artists don't show their work to even their parents because they understand that um, that outer critic will come in and, and challenge them. But as you mentioned, we all have inner critics as well. Mm -hmm. And I think as we get older, one of the tools is learning to recognize how your inner critic communicates with you. Mm. So it took me a while to figure this out, but my inner critic starts with the question, um, why, why can't you figure out how to do this faster? Why can't you figure this out? You've been working on it for a month. You know, why can't you make more money off of this project? Why can't? And so my inner critic starts with white a lot. As soon as I recognized that, I could recognize her when she started talking. Mm. And I'd be like, oh, this is my inner critic. And I could figure out how to shut her down. So when I talk to people about what does your inner critic sound like, often you have a, a catchphrase like that. You know, they'll say, my inner critic always starts with, you always this, you mm. always that. And as soon as I hear that, I know inner critic. So everybody has a different way that their inner critic talks to them. Once you recognize it, you can say, hey, inner critic, shut up. I'm not listening <laughs> to you right now. But we have to recognize it. And then the other tool is what I call whose voice do you need in your head, mm. which is if our inner critics are talking really loudly and we don't want to risk going to somebody who could turn into an outer critic, it's good to identify those people in your life who, who provide different kinds of voices for you. And I know who they are in my life now. So when I'm feeling down and I just need encouragement, I have a friend who's always that person who's going to say, oh, Teresa, you'll figure this out. You always do. You're so smart, right? And she builds me up. When I need a kick in the butt because I'm stalling <laughs> or I'm procrastinating, I have another friend that I call and she'll be like, uh-huh, excuses. I'm hearing excuses. You know, and she <laughs> kicks me in the butt. These people don't know that they are that person for me. I haven't told them I'm calling you because I want you to kick me in the butt. I just know whose voice I need to hear at different points, ideation process. And I talk about that in the book in one of the sections where I talk about protecting that, that burst of brilliance is key. You do not want to take that great idea or wet blanket friend. Because they're like, my husband is my wet blanket. Um, I run upstairs and I tell him a great, great idea. And he's very practical, very analytical. And his response will be, wait, didn't you try that a couple years ago? Or ah. where are you going to get the money for that? So I don't go to him, right? I go to him later in the process when I'm like, okay, I got it all ready. I've thought it all through. Now poke hole. I, I need to see what I'm missing. <laughs> But I don't go to him in the beginning anymore. I go to somebody who's going to encourage the ideation. And my husband is an amazingly awesome person, by the way. <laughs> but, but he's very analytical and very practical. Mm -hmm. He's not the best person to go to at the start of an ideation process. So I sure. think, you know, those, those tools can be very helpful. It's so, I, I'm so impressed with everything you just said. And my husband is the same way, by the way, the, the, the whole, oh, but. Let me talk to you about the practical, the analytical, and let me poke holes in it thing. I, I completely understand. Our husbands would probably have a great time having a beer together. And and, <laughs> yes. and, 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 and it and it is helpful, absolutely, to have that later in the process. But I, I do want to say that I love how inherently so much of what you're talking about seems to be about self-awareness. You have to be aware you have to have a certain amount of awareness of what you as an artist need in the moment. You need your friend who's going to be the cheerleader. You need your friend who's going to call you on your procrastination. But the most important thing is you know when to go to whom. And I'm wondering, did you nurture that inside yourself? Did you build it somehow? 
or is it just an inherent thing that you know how to do? Um, that is a good question. I mean, I, I was lucky to have a mother who supported my art from the start and my dad too. Um, but my mom in particular thought I was a great writer and, and, you know, she was very supportive of that. Mm -hmm. And so I was lucky to have that kind of, of an upbringing, but I know many people who were not, who did not have that. And they still went on to be great artists, oftentimes just to prove wrong, the people um, doubted them in the earlier days of their life. So the self-awareness thing, I think is really, I think it is really important. And I think part of that is learning what you personally need. And I have kind of a funny entry in the book that people resonated with where I just, I said, you know, potato chips are good and chocolate's good and a drink is what you need. And I, I turned all these things that we think of as junk and bad for you into something good. If that's what sparks your, your creative process. So the self-awareness is understanding and going back to when you were a child, what comforted you? What, what made you feel safe? Because in order to be brave, sometimes we need to feel a little safe first. If we're mm -hmm. going to take a big risk, we need to feel a little safe before we take that big, scary step. So what makes you feel safe? What makes you feel comforted? What makes you feel happy? Because when we're doing our art, we're connecting with passion, hopefully, so, you know, what can you do to make yourself feel happy before you start to work? So I think you're absolutely right. I think self-awareness is a big part of having that confidence to pursue your art. It's also something that self-awareness to me is always a, a, about sort of a, a higher calling almost. When you know yourself really well, you can behave in the world from a different plane, I would say. And so I, I would love to know what your thoughts are on that, on being an artist and looking to connect perhaps with your, your art, with your higher self, and also how that might connect you to others, maybe artists, maybe not artists, but, but that idea of, of thinking loftier thinking greater than you are in your art how how does that happen and how can we look to our higher selves to make those connections yes and I talk about that a lot in the book i also talk about it a lot in the blog which is that um, the best artists are the ones who trust their intuition and that can be for a tiny decision. it can be for a big decision um, so nurturing your intuition and learning to really rely on that is touching your higher self because your higher self is always going to have your best interest. It's never going to steer you towards something that's going to harm you. And so learning to trust your higher self means that you have that confidence that you're on the right path with your art, with your career, with something that scares you a little bit. Um, so I think learning to act intuition, trust your intuition and learning what that means, like whether you do that by studying different philosophies, different um, religions, different ways to access our intuition. Um, that's one way of we all were born with intuition. Every single one of us have it. Some people have just chosen to nurture it and pay more attention to it. It's a choice. And we can make that choice anytime we want to. So I think, you know, I think following our intuition and touching into our higher selves is critical as artists, because if we are called to do something, if we're feeling passionate about something, that probably isn't coming just from within us. It's probably coming from some guidance that wants to take us higher, that wants to raise our vibra vibration. So if we follow that, and then that feels good and it's successful, then we're going to do more of that. So the higher self to me, listening to the higher self is really important. And then when you asked about connecting to others, I think there's magic in, in art. And I don't think that that's a coincidence. I think it way that we as human beings connect, for example, have you ever been sitting at a concert next to a total stir? and the singer hits that great, awesome note, and you turn to this stranger and you both light up together at the exact same time, and this tremendous connection was just made with a total stranger, 
that's what art can do connects us across all areas and so I think it's really important to have that feeling of art when you're creating yes it is for you but it's going to make a connection with someone else as well your art will and that brings us all together and I think we really need that now more than ever oh I agree completely completely agree and it's funny what you said about the the concert and h hearing someone make a high note or whatever absolutely that that kind of thing as as a musician on stage that has happened to me i sing in lots of languages and i've traveled all over the world performing and i'll sing in japanese or i'll sing in italian and people respond to it even if they don't know what the words mean they respond to the music there's something universal about creating that allows us all to look or listen or touch whatever that art is and be elevated by it so i completely agree and yet that connection when we have it is it is it something that we can nourish further or is it just the acknowledgement that you think is the most important thing, the acknowledgement of the connection? I definitely think we can nourish it further. Um, you know, we're a pretty polarized country right now. And one of the things that does connect people is art and music and, you know, television shows and all of those things. Um, give us a sense of a common connection and a common good and a, a place to start from. You know, when you want to talk to somebody who's very different from you or whose opinions are very different from yours, if you can start with that common ground and where do you find it? You often find it by asking a question like, you know, what was your, you know, your, the first record you ever bought. Right. Right. And people light up and they want to tell that story and they want to talk about a musician they loved. And so, I do think we can nurture it intentionally, that connection, by saying, hey, art has a healing feature to it, and it can connect us. It can also move us. And we've seen that in, for example, the civil rights movement, how important the music was to moving people forward in their thinking, in their actions, in um, the bravery they showed to make a difference. The music was fundamental to the civil rights movement. So I think it can, it can be that bridge and it people forward at the same time, which is pretty fascinating to me. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you. It, it, it's, it's like I'm everything I'm saying is yes, yes, Teresa, I agree. Yes. <laughs> because, <laughs> because what you're saying speaks to me on such a deep level. And it's so it's so interesting, the idea of, of music specifically in my in my mind and heart, you know, they used to use marches to ignite people to go to war, but then they also play taps at the end of the night. You know, there's so many ways that music and literature, movies, art in general can can unite us, can unite us behind a, sing, a single goal, for example. And I, I, it makes me think about the inauguration that and I actually don't know that we're recording this beforehand, but the inauguration has happened by the time you hear this episode. So whoever the musical guests were, it's interesting to me how they would choose somebody who would perform something that would hopefully unite us. That's what that's what President elect Biden is saying that that he's a uniter that he wants to bring the entire country together. And so I'm wondering with 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 the music with whatever arts going to be happening over this next year. How do you think that we, and by we, I mean all of us, because, you know, as you said, we all have a, an artist inside us. How do you think we can use art and creativity to move forward more positively, moving forward in 2021 and beyond? Well, one of the things I think is really interesting is um, what we spent during the pandemic to the artists. And that is that many artists who were, say, introverts or they were more um, deeply focused type of artists, 
they actually found that their productivity and their creativity improved during the pandemic Mm. because now they got to work from home, which means they were a few steps away from their studio. So if they finished a meeting and they wanted to walk over and work on their art, they didn't have the long commute time to work. So they had more time for their art. They were home. And so they were able to keep that, you know, introverted energy for their art. Mm -hmm. And then we saw other artists where the opposite happened, where they just didn't ask much work last year because their energy was low. They were worried. They had lost a lot of gigs and a lot of income. Mm -hmm. Um, They lost the energy of being around other people and creatives and collaboratives. Um, And so thing in between, we saw artists that did well in the pandemic, artists that really suffered in the pandemic and everything in between. So I think it was an it was an opportunity for us as artists to dig deep and say, what do I need to create? What makes me a strong creator? And coming out of this now, coming out of that very difficult year of 2020 with not just the pandemic, but social unrest and political unrest, I think we're seeing artists that will now be regathering their energy and saying, I now know what I need. I need more time alone in my studio, or I need collaborative effort of being out with an audience. And I think we're going to see art sort of take off in 2021, where those of us who've been really introspective and reflective are starting to figure out what's my next step do next. So I'm really hoping that we are going to see artists step up now and say, I've been thinking about this a lot over the last year. And I, I do have something to contribute to helping us all come together to bridging the gaps, to improving our systems in this country. Um, I think we are going to see that from art because this, this time has kind of forced us all to figure out maybe before we were too busy to think about what worked and what didn't work. And we've had that time to do that now. So I think there's going to be a research art, and I'm very excited about that. I hope so. Uh, and, and it, it, you know, it's interesting. It comes back to me, to self-awareness, to, to building that, oh, I, this is what I need, and I, and I have that in my mind moving forward into 2021, which I think is so great. Now, you, 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 you were talking about how artists will – innovate essentially will will contribute to the innovations and the creativity moving forward of of their communities of cities of companies what do you think what do you think are the pathways for that like do artists have to go hey i have this great idea or do you think companies and organizations nonprofits are going to reach out to creatives and artists and go hey you've probably been ruminating on some of this, what do you think? What do you think the process of that's going to look like? That's a really good because I am definitely not putting this all on the artists. I'm really hoping for and calling out to and trying to be an example for people who are in a, in a position, a decision-making position at the city level or the nonprofits or the faith communities or wherever people like to gather to say, um, you you can come to us too. You know, you can be a conduit for, so for example, in our city, that we have a very popular art program called Pianos Around Town. Mm. And the city pays artists to paint old pianos. And they put these pianos up in public places and little kids sit down and play them and very professional musicians sit down and play them. And they sound terrible because they're out in the elements and everybody loves it. And so if you can successfully run a program like that and pay artists to do it and it creates goodwill and community, then what else could you do? Could you start a list where businesses could connect with artists? Let's say a business owner owns a building that has a, an outside wall that would be perfect for a mural. You know, is there a way the city could get involved in provide a connector between businesses and artists? So if a business is going to have a, big Christmas party and they need a musician, Mm -hmm. where, how can they go to find that person? And so I do think that businesses and the, the other sectors can step up and say, 
we don't want it to always be the artists coming to us. Um, we want to reach out to and say, we need a collaborative effort and you help us with this. Like, I mean, I get ideas. I'm a big ideator. The other day I was thinking about, there's like this intersection in town and it's always a problem. And they put up these signs that look like your standard city signs. And after, you might notice it when it first goes up, but after a month or so, nobody notices the signs anymore. It just becomes, you know, white noise. You don't see it. I was like, what if they had an artist repaint that sign that says look left or whatever it says um, every month? Mm -hmm. And then it just continued to catch people's attention. You'd be doing a service for the community. You'd be improving safety and you'd be employing an artist. Um, that, those are the kinds of things that we could all collaborate to do, but it takes, it takes raising awareness of how artists can contribute across the sectors, not just in the arts. And again, absolutely positive. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm, I should get out the pom-poms and just, and be your cheer, walk around behind you and be your <laughs> cheerleader. Absolutely. And you know, it's fascinating to me, this idea of, of cities and and organizations communities actively seeking out artists for how they can contribute to elevate not just how things look but also the infrastructure like you just said painting is a city sign it might my dentist hires this artist to come in every season this artist comes in and she, my dentist is vegan and he hires an artist to come and paint a mural on the window of his office that has something to do with dentistry and being vegan every turn of the season. So on the equinoxes mm -hmm. and on the solstices, that's what he does. And frankly, it's been good for his business, at least a little, because that's how I chose him as my dentist, you know? And he said, actually, a lot of people come in because, right. of the, you know, because of these really fun murals. Mm -hmm. So it improves businesses. And I'm wondering what kind of PR firm or campaign we would have to start in order for that to become more commonplace where artists and communities looked to each other for how they could solve some of these problems creatively, innovatively, and also functionally. What are your thoughts exactly. on that? Oh, and when you said the word PR, my mind went immediately to, um, you know, I hear business owners constantly complaining. I was just seeing this the other day about the low open rate for their newsletters, mm. right? And you think, okay, what if you gave away local art on your newsletter every month? And it was things that people would want or need, like earrings, um, some sort of thing that you could put on your desk, a CD from a local artist. You know, people would open the newsletter, if nothing else, to see what was available that month. I know right. this because I did it for a while and it was fantastically fun. I love and it. And then you're supporting, you're supporting a local artist. Or if you had a local artist do an original illustration for your newsletter every time. And let's like, as you said, it ties to your, to your company and it's beautiful and people open the newsletter just to see that piece of art. So I think part of it, is we're talking about engagement here like how do we engage our customers and our clients how do we engage the citizens in our community and to show up for a city council meeting well if you open the meeting a favorite band playing first maybe some people will come and maybe some mm -hmm. of those people would stay and so i think a big part of it is thinking about again you're talking about engagement you're talking about giving people something that connects and that's what art does. And so I think that's a big part of it right there. You've got my mind whirling. I love it. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I could keep you here for the next six hours and chat with you, but I know that you have a life to get back to. So uh, I would love to find out from you, is there anything else that you would like to say before we uh, close because I, I know we want to talk about your social media links and also Bursts of Brilliance. And oh, oh, I did want to say, is it okay with you if the show notes reflect the books that you've written? I'd like to put the covers on and also maybe links to them so that all of your new fans can go <laughs> find them and, 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 and grab them for themselves. Oh, absolutely. Um, it's kind of funny because my mind works, you know, goes in different directions each this morning. It was on visual art course, um, I myself am a writer and I've written seven fiction books about World War II. Each book is based on a real person that I interviewed. Mm. 
Mm, and wow. so it's a really unique form of writing. My books have been that way. I have two for adults, and then I have a, a five-part children's series. And every book is based on a real person that I interviewed. Most of them have passed away now, of course. Um, but it was a really unique way to approach storytelling. And I'm super proud of of those books and, and the fiction that I write. And, um, and then, of course, the blog is a weekly blog. It was originally designed to provide inspiration and encouragement for artists and entrepreneurs. And then over time, I started finding out that people in healthcare and teachers and business owners were reading my blog. <laughs> and I was very excited and moved by that. So um, now I have a lot of readers that are not just artists and entrepreneurs, and that's been really fun. Um, and how it has changed a, a little bit about how I, you know, position the blog. And so, yes, I'd be, I would be very excited and grateful for people to connect with all of my writing, which means a lot to me. And I would appreciate that. Oh, that'd be great. So I will definitely be putting all of that on the show notes and also your Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, uh, all of that's going to go on the show notes and also your website. So there's so much and, and you have, so let me just be sure there's facebook.com slash bursts of brilliance, but there's also facebook.com slash Teresa Funk and company. So there's, there are a whole bunch of different links that if people want to follow bursts of brilliance more, they can do that. And if people want to follow the company and reach out to you about some of the work you're doing, they can do that. Am I, am I correct on that? You are correct. And so for a long time, Teresa Funk and Company is my umbrella company. Um, and people go there to access really fun information about my World War II books and also writing advice and resources and videos. And then Bursts of Brilliance has its own website and its own social media because there we focus really strongly on providing inspiration for your brilliance, for mm. your for tapping into your feelings that day and what's going to inspire you. And so it's a very different kind of social media. Mm -hmm. We do have people who follow both. Um, but yes, definitely Bursts of Brilliance is that inspirational side. And so is Teresa Funk and Company, but it's more fun information about World War II or about being a writer. So that's the difference. Ah, perfect. Well, all of that will be in the show notes so that anybody who is, if you're listening to this, obviously you need to go find and follow both Bursts of Brilliance and Teresa Funk and Company. There's all sorts of wonderful information for you there. Uh, and Teresa, I, I'm so grateful that you took the time. I know you're super busy. I'm, I'm really grateful that you took the time to talk about these incredibly important topics, especially as we move forward and in, in, into 2021. So thank you so much for, for being here. I appreciate it very much. Oh, Zelda, it was wonderful. And, and I know that you share my heart on a lot of these things. And so I enjoyed learning more about you and, and just having this opportunity to chat with a, a fellow creative, someone who believes in inner artists has been great. Oh, it's yeah. Believe you me. <laughs> I, everything you were saying, I was like, yes, yes, more people should know about this. So I'm very excited to, to bring your story to uh, all of all of my listeners. And I have one last question that I ask everybody who comes on the show. It's, it's a silly question, but I find that it yields poignant answers. And I would love to ask it if that's okay with you. Sure. Okay. It's a really simple question. If you had a plane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Well, of course, I'd have to say brilliance. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah, because I want people to look up and just feel brilliant in that moment. It feels so good. It feels so good to allow yourself to feel brilliant, even just for a moment. It sparks so many ideas and creative energy. So, yeah, it would say brilliance. Oh, see, perfect, simple. I love it. All right. Well, thank you so much, Teresa, again, for joining me today. I really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to seeing more about how you encourage people and communities to engage their inner artists and their bursts of brilliance. Thank you again. Thank you. This is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Innovative Mindset Podcast. If you have enjoyed today's show, obviously you need to go find Teresa Funk and follow her 
Obviously, that goes without saying. But also, do me a favor and rate and review the show. Let me know what you're thinking about it. It it helps me know what kind of guests to have, what kind of things I need to be focusing on to give you what you need. And until next time, again, this is Isolde Trachtenberg reminding you to listen, learn, laugh, and love a whole lot. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new. And if you like what you're hearing, please review it and rate it and let other people know. And if you'd like to be a sponsor of the show, I'd love to meet you on patreon.com slash innovative mindset. I also have lots of exclusive goodies to share just with the show's supporters there. Today's episode was produced by Zolda Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living in your innovative mindset. <laughs>